Hello, Keith Kaiser here with another study from God's Word. We're looking at studies in the book of Acts. Today we're at Acts chapter 4, verse 1. Acts 4 and verse 1. Now as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Now we see this is the sequel to what had just been going on, that Peter and John went up to pray in the temple, and there was this lame man laid by the beautiful gate. And he asked alms of them. He wanted some kind of charitable donation. And Peter said famously, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And fulfilling prophecies like that uh, back in the book of Isaiah, this man rose up and walked in the name of Jesus. It was messianic power coming through the Holy Spirit of God through Peter and John. And Peter would flat out tell the crowd there that it wasn't through our own power and godliness that this man walked, but it was through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the great issue of the early chapters in Acts, the Lord's name. It is that name which connotes authority and power, because it is the name of God's ordained Savior. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins, Matthew 1 says. And he's the Messiah, the anointed, chosen, pre-selected prophet, priest, and king. And, of course, the one who became the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world at the cross of Calvary. But now the one who's risen again from the dead. Now that preaching not only made a stir among the crowd, but where God's working, Satan will oppose. There will be those who rise up with enmity in their hearts against the gospel of Christ. And so we read in verse 1, As they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. So these are the very same cobble of folks, along with the Pharisees, who aren't mentioned here, that really were the ringleaders in denouncing and crucifying the Lord Jesus Christ. They delivered him up to the Romans to be killed. As Peter said in Acts 2, you've taken him by wicked hands and have crucified and slain him. And so uh, many of these same enemies are still opposing the cause of the Lord. It's interesting to read verse 2. They were being greatly disturbed that the people, uh, that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. If you wanted to boil down the early preaching of the church and what the apostles were saying, it was all about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. They're preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And later in Acts 17, when Paul is on Mars Hill, that's still the thing that is the prominent issue. In fact, what led him to Mars Hill was he's dialoguing with people in the marketplace, and they said he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he spoke about Jesus and the resurrection. So those Gentile pagans in Acts 17, idolaters though they were, they thought he was talking about two gods, Jesus and the Anastasis, the resurrection. That would be the word they would use there, from which we derive the beautiful name Anastasia. But in any case, uh, these folks here who don't want to hear about Jesus and who don't even believe in the resurrection, that's an issue for the Sadducees. They're the modernists of antiquity. They're theological liberals. They don't believe in the miraculous. A priori, they reject the idea that there can be such a thing as the resurrection from the dead. And they certainly don't want to admit that Jesus, of all people, rose from the dead because they are the ones, after all, who called him a blasphemer and who said he was a danger, a seditious person, and that he was a threat to the Romans. That was the line they sold to Pilate, or tried to at least, to get our Lord executed on the cross. And they didn't like it one little bit. Now, you might say, you know, if Jesus is really not who he claimed to be, if he's a dead man in the grave, and if there's no such a thing as the resurrection, then why is it that people like the Sadducees get so bothered by the preaching of Jesus and the resurrection? They could just write it off as superstition and falsehood. 
but they can't leave it there any more than the so-called new atheists of our day can leave the Lord Jesus and his resurrection alone. Like one Christian writer doing a book review of the late Christopher Hitchens book, God is not great, how religion poisons everything. He said, basically the thesis of this book is there is no God and I hate him. <laughs> now that's kind of funny. It's putting it in an ironic way, of course, a bit of satire there that Hitchens didn't like the idea of God. But when you listen to what he said in his public talks, it wasn't just any old God. It was especially the God of the Bible, the Judeo-Christian God, the God who revealed himself through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't want anything to do with him, and neither do Dawkins or Dennett or Sam Harris or the other new atheists that may be out there and abounding. But, you know, you say, well, guys, if Jesus isn't who he claimed to be, and if there's no such thing as the resurrection, then why are you so mad? You know, we may shake our heads at people that believe fairy tales and falsehoods, that believe in uh, the tooth fairy, that believe in, you know, the abominable snowman, that believe in UFOs, whatever. But I don't get mad and arrest people or try to have people put to death for preaching those things or believing those things. But when it came to preaching Jesus and the resurrection, they didn't like that. And they laid hands on them, it says in verse 3, and put them in custody. So they actually arrested them. They brought their physical judicial power to bear on these men and put pressure on them. Now, that still is very much with us today. I was listening in to a meeting uh, in Canada the other day with a brother in the Lord from India. I didn't previously know him. But he was saying to us, you know, I'm on bail right now. He was leading the Bible study this particular night. He said, I'm on bail for giving out gospel tracts. Now, in the United States where I live, you can do that freely. In many Western countries, probably the majority, if not all of them, you can freely give out literature. You can give out Bibles and books and tracts. But where he lives, his part of India, there's persecution for it. He's gotten arrested for it. And there are many other countries of the world. And not saying that that happens everywhere in India, but the particular spot he lives in, there's definite opposition, definite physical persecution. And he's been uh, in trouble with the authorities because of it. Not for committing any crime of hurting anybody or robbing something or, or anything like that. Giving out the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's an amazing thing when such things become a crime. You know, on the university campuses, though, in the West, uh, many of them, many of the people there would like to consider it a crime to talk about Jesus and the resurrection. You can talk about any sort of belief you want and not get into very much trouble. But we don't want to hear about Jesus and the resurrection. And uh, small wonder, really, because if Jesus was who he claimed to be, then the Bible's right. He not, didn't just come into the world once to save the world. But he's coming again to judge the world. And this is the thing that the Athenians didn't like in Acts 17 about it, that Paul said he is appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he's ordained, whereof he's given assurance of this to all in that he hath raised him from the dead. So the man who rose again from the dead, he's God's choice to be the judge of all the earth. He's going to come and reign over the earth as king and king of kings and lord of lords and put all enemies under his feet and human beings are going to have to contend with him and through history he's the one that people have attacked and vilified and still write and speak against but they can't destroy the lord jesus they can't efface his name from the rolls of history nor can they disprove the historic physical bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ that these eyewitnesses authenticated, that they pointed to and said, Jesus is who he claimed to be. He is Lord. He is Christ because God raised him from the dead. They didn't like that preaching then. And frankly, if you preach that today, a lot of people won't like you either. There will be repercussions. There will be people that try to do things against you for that. And as we've said, in some countries, it becomes physical opposition against the Lord's people because of their preaching of Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. Now, it says they laid their hands on them, put them in custody until the next day, because this is going to lead to a trial that will 
learn about in a subsequent study as we look into chapter 4 further. But it says it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, verse 4 says, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. So, yes, there's opposition. Yes, the messengers are going to have to spend a night in jail. But thanks be to God, the word is bearing fruit. You know, Paul elsewhere will talk in the Bible about being bound, but he says the word of God is not bound. You're going to lock up the messenger, but ultimately you can't lock up the word. I remember reading about believers in Russia and how there was, uh, during the communist days of the Soviet Union, there were persecutions against many of the Christians, and there were very few Bibles, and yet the Bibles that there were were used over and over again to lead thousands of people to Christ. I remember even hearing about a man who would read quotations of the Bible in the atheist textbooks that were so-called refuting the Bible. And he would put those quotes together till he had reassembled large sections of the Bible. And it was through that that he came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you can't stop the gospel. You can't get it out of the world. In fact, thanks be to God, he's sending forth missionaries all over the world today to take the Bible into countries where there's a dearth of it, and also, in many cases, to take it to peoples that have never had it and translate it into their vernacular, their mother tongue, what we might call their heart language. And people today increasingly are hearing the Word of God. And when you think of the smartphone apps where people can read the Bible in good translations in multiple languages, where people can look up Greek and Hebrew words and see what they mean, where people can search them through the Bible and see how the Spirit of God uses vocabulary in the Scripture and the many beautiful word studies and things that can go through the Bible. And we've never lived in a time on earth when there have been so many Bibles, so many tools for studying the Bible, and so many platforms and technologies for disseminating the Bible. And the Word of God is going around the earth. And we in some of our Western countries, we might say, well, a lot of people don't want it. You know, I offer the Bible to people. They say no. And not always. Sometimes we still get to give it out to people here and there. So don't give up, dear believer, in the United States and Canada. There is indeed an apathy and a spiritual coldness. And uh, unfortunately, the church even is cold and doesn't spend as much time as it once did reading the Bible or expounding the Bible deeply. But that doesn't mean we should stop. Every individual believer needs to feed on the Word because the written Word is what we feed on the living Word, the Lord Jesus Christ. He reveals himself through this book. And it's also through the Bible that people are converted. It's how they come to faith in Christ. They're born again through the Spirit by believing the Word of God. The Word is seed that produces eternal life. So keep disseminating the seed. Keep giving out tracts. New Testaments, Bibles, as you're able. But when we think about other countries, I've been in other parts of the world, in the developing world, again, where the people, because of poverty or circumstance, uh, haven't had good opportunity with the Bible. And getting to take some uh, gifts to people in other countries sometimes that they could procure Bibles, and the joy they had at getting the Word of God. Sometimes you can see it on YouTube or other platforms, uh, when uh, the different missionaries go and they translate a portion of God's Word, like the New Testament or the whole Bible, into a certain language, the community comes together and they have a dedication of that Bible. They celebrate it. And what a wonderful thing it is. It's truly riches to have the Word of God. It's a treasure. There's an old chorus, I have a wonderful treasure, the gift of God without measure. We will travel together my Bible and I. You know, there's nothing like the Word of God. There's no other book that has the Word of life in it that can tell us the truth and that can be the means of God sanctifying us. The Lord said, Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy Word is truth in John 17, 17. Now, those who heard the Word believed. So even though there was persecution, opposition, arrest the preachers, put them in jail, some had already believed on the word, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000, which seems like it's a follow-up comment to what we read at the end of chapter 2, where there were 3,000 that believed on the day of Pentecost. 
It started in chapter 1 with 120 in an upper room. Maybe there were some believers here and there elsewhere, but that was the majority of them. Then 3,000 converted on a single day in Pentecost, and now the number has come to be about 5,000. So the word of God is growing and increasing. As a modern Christian song says, the family's growing. The Lord is saving people. His word is going forth and people are believing it and being born again. So don't faint. Pray and disseminate the word. Give it out however you can. Quote it to people. Share it by track form. Give out copies of it. Point people to good sound websites where the word of God is or where they can hear it expounded or even read. I mean, tremendous days. What opportunities we have. Be faithful. Give out the word and it will bear fruit. You leave it to the Lord and he'll do the rest. Thank you for listening.